Growing up in Australia, whenever the discussion of anime fights came up, that is in the 2000s and 2010s, there were two series on the lips of every schoolboy, and that was Dragon Ball Z and Naruto. But regardless of where on the map you are, these are two classic anime known and loved for their fights, but more particularly, their action animation. The most fascinating aspect of all though, is how fundamentally different the top animators on both approach this area. The philosophy of Dragon Ball Z's top action animators stem predominantly from the Kanada school, focusing on pose-to-pose -pose based movement with strong key drawings, irregular frame modulation, and stylized effects animation interspersed throughout. While on the opposite end, you had the Realist School, or more specifically, as Matteo Waltz describes, the Flow School, with a focus on more complex choreography, a consistent flow of detailed movement, and a prioritization of the overall motion rather than distinct linear actions. On that note, this video isn't to castigate one as bad and the other good, but rather to dissect the philosophy of two different schools of thought behind two classic shonen. To celebrate the work of these talented animators and put them in the spotlight, and with that, letting you know the names behind some of your favorite fights. So while the Canada style had dominated in the late 70s and much of the 80s, the late 80s would see the rise of the realist school with movies like Akira and series such as Gosenzo Summer, Ban Ban Zai being clear landmarks in this shift. And in the 90s, the flow school would emerge from it, borrowing from both. From the realist, their nuance and details to a specific movement, while with the Canada school, they embraced the use of frame modulation. However, their own additions would be an unwavering adherence to fluid motion rather than movement that snaps from pose to pose. But how did this style of action make its way over to Naruto? Well, in many ways, but one of its biggest, Noria Matsumoto. Much like Arafumi Mai's style of action would be woven into Attack on Titan's identity, Noria Matsumoto would be one of the main players in defining Naruto's fluid action style. With the earlier days of his career involving work on movies like Akira and Grave of the Fireflies, it shouldn't be all that surprising that the influence of realism would seep into his work. And having worked on shonen classics like Rurouni Kenshin and Hunter x Hunter, by the time of Studio Piero's new show Naruto, Matsumoto not only had the experience for action, but had established himself as one of the top action animators in the industry. And he would prove that again, but this time to an entirely new generation. However, as important as his work was, influential episodes like 30, 71, and 133 would never have come to be if it wasn't for his old classmate and close friend, Atsushi Wakabayashi. Wakabayashi, much like Matsumoto, was a devout follower of the flow school. However, with an out of dynamic touch, often bringing what is referred to as background animation into his scenes. Though certainly difficult and complex, it further ties into the principle of motion, and with his mixture of extreme foreshortening and angles, it achieved it in quite a compelling way. But then came Naruto. Having just finished up his work on Ghost in the Shell SAC, Naruto's director Hiyato Day spotted him in the office and asked if he would handle episode 30. In Wakabayashi's own words, Sasuke's Sharingan story didn't exactly click with him, but knowing it was an important episode, he took on the challenge. Wakabayashi had already changed TV action animation around with his work on Yu Yu Hakusho, and he was about to do it again. Not only would he provide key animation, but sit as its animation supervisor, episode director, and storyboarder. With that level of creative freedom given to Wakabayashi, it was bound to be something great. And of course, for it to be, he would call up his old friend, Norio Matsumoto. His vision was for himself, Norio, and another old friend from his Yu Yu Hakusho days, Atsuko Inoue, handle the key animation all themselves. Of course, in flow style fashion, the designs are simplified, shadows are kept to a minimum, with often simple shapes if any shadows are used at all. Less line is also used, and the lines themselves have a rounded touch. Now, the amount of each one of these elements might vary between the members of this trio, but is all done for the same reason to achieve greater flexibility with the models and to make it easier to animate. Now, both in Noe's and Wakabayashi's incredibly loose scene with Anko is noteworthy, it's Matsumoto who steals the show. With a storyboard drawn with him in mind and the freedom to do what he wanted, Matsumoto creates some of the best scenes the series had seen yet. Now, let's take a look at some of it with this scene as Sasuke takes on Orochimaru. After Sasuke charges forward and some excellent smoke effects, he spins through the air chucking several kunai. What makes this so fun and interesting to watch is how he does it. Matsumoto doesn't want some static shot of Sasuke leaping in the air with a still and chucking a couple of kunai. He wants this move to have flow and force. 
To do this, Matsumoto spins Sasuke's whole body around, completely deforming the character in certain frames, while keeping his model fairly intact in others. These blobby drawings may look a little odd in isolation, but their intention is to assist the movement to make it look loose. The wide spacing between the drawings gives a nice snap to illustrate how quick these movements are. In motion, as animation is of course meant to be seen, it looks great. Even as Sasuke launches a couple of kicks after, he spins around before touching the ground. These extra details add a lot of flair to a cut, but fit in well with a character like Sasuke who's young and lacks combat experience. His moves are big while Orochimaru's are more calculated than concise. Just another detail to why Matsumoto is so impressive. The action steps up again with this cut of the two exchanging blows, and you can especially see here that principle of complex bursts of action at play, one of the first principles of this school we went over at the start. It sits around about 3 seconds, but you have up to 8 different main actions. And even if that is quite a detailed cut, it's readable firstly thanks to the wide angle used in the storyboard and Matsumoto's pacing, it's not too fast or slow either. Of course though, we're talking about Shonen where big punches reign supreme, so how does Matsumoto handle one? Well, a little later after Sasuke is swinging through the trees, Orochimaru runs towards him, lands a hit directly in the face, then follows it up with more blows. Going into the punch, the anticipation is great, not just in terms of the poses, but the amount of screen time, making what's about to take place pretty clear to the audience. What changes though is the timing suddenly switching to ones, which refers to the amount of drawings used per frame. For most of what we've gone over so far, he's stuck predominantly to twos, and in the cut just before this one, threes. This change in timing is a subtle but useful way to depict a contrast in motion. By having a new drawing every frame, it gives a sudden smoothness to the animation. It stands out to what just came before. Sounds great in theory, but is more difficult to pull off in practice. Not only does it require double the amount of drawings than animating on twos, but there's then the other hurdle of working with this frame rate, and that's the difficulty of keeping consistency and volume between each drawing. And considering the spacing is quite tight, it's really easy for a wobbly effect to take place. Not only does Matsumoto avoid such a problem, but he tackles the camera rotation as if things weren't already difficult. Then comes the hit. He comes in with a smear, although he still keeps the general shape of the arm fairly intact, to still portray some solidity. Matsumoto isn't afraid of abstraction, but in this scenario using a big blob wouldn't be as effective. There's then the contact, he holds on the punch for two frames and adds some camera shake to emphasize the impact. Although what makes this punch truly weighty isn't just the contact, but more so everything that comes after. Not only do the off-model expressions look rugged, but it's how his head swings in before falling back. It gives this extra snap and makes it look all the more painful. You can see the same format again in episode 133, but a step up in intensity again. It begins with a big punch, contorted facial expressions, then a barrage of very animated hits thereafter. There's constant movement, but again, readability is never a problem thanks to the perfect duo of excellent storyboarding and animation. Reflecting back, Wakabayashi noted those three episodes, 30, 71, and 133, his intention was to make history, and that he very much did. The flow style was presented in a way it never had been before and to a mainstream audience. Documenting the influence these episodes had is a topic all in of itself, even if isolated to just a Naruto franchise. However, one of its most important figures it would spur on would be Hiroyuki Yamashita. Originally set on being a background artist, changed course after seeing those episodes and pursued the career of an animator. In time, he would get to work on the franchise he loved so much with Naruto Shippuden and eventually mentored personally by his idol, Norio Matsumoto. Even though Matsumoto's involvement wasn't all too high with Shippuden and we never got a true Wakabayashi Matsumoto combo, both of their influence had already cemented itself with Yamashita taking on the flow skill mantle to fights like Sasuke vs Killer B, with simplicity to the drawings and energetic movement to the max. With his work likewise inspiring an entire new generation, such as Naoki Kobayashi, the talented animator behind Madara taking on the allied shinobi forces, then going on to animate a chunk of the Kakashi vs Obito fight, while working with his mentor Yamashita, the architect of that legendary battle, then other superb scenes in later years in Boruto, such as Sakura vs Shin. There was then Chang Shi Huang, coincidentally who gained his aspirations to be an animator from Dragon Ball Z, later taking inspiration from both Matsumoto and Yamashita, to then have his chance to be mentored by the latter, then going on to work on the final fight between Sasuke and Naruto, and would be the mastermind behind Boruto's episode 65. Safe to say the flow school had made its mark, and Naruto being one of its crowning achievements.
Despite Yoshinori Kanata never being directly present on Dragon Ball, his influence certainly was, and quite literally from the beginning, with his classic fire dragon sneaking in within the first three seconds of the show's opening. Although it wouldn't be until Dragon Ball Z you would see his followers gather. Ironically, it wouldn't be through his best friend who was a regular on the production, Masayuki Uchiyama, or his team. But rather, it would be through names such as Masahiro Shimanuki, Kazuya Hisada, Naoki Tate, Masaki Iwane, Esau Sugimoto, and Keisuke Masanaga, the show's top action animators, it would shine the clearest in. For some added context, none of these animators were from Toei, although half of the names mentioned would be by the following decade, but at this time rather from two studios, Seigasha and Cockpit. You see, Toei Animation throughout the 90s, just like the decades before, had a considerable amount of anime productions on their plate. And keep in mind, a single animated episode requires thousands of drawings, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of background art to be painted, and then the photography of each individual cell, among a plethora of other details. To put it simply, many staff are required, as is time. And so when it came to Dragon Ball Z, it would be important to outsource much of the work. What this means simply is that many studios were heavily involved in producing animation for Dragon Ball. A matter of fact, the majority of Dragon Ball Z wasn't animated by Toei's own in-house staff. With GT, that does begin to change though, and by the time of Dragon Ball Super, it's another thing entirely, but the Z era was a little different. Now, it's no secret Dragon Ball Z, like many long-running TV shows, wasn't that animated on the whole. The one thing it wasn't in short supply of was talented directors, and teamed up with a bunch of Canada fans from Cockpit and Seigasha, you were sure to get something special. One of the first occurrences is in Episode 4. It sees one of the series' best, director and storyboarder Yoshihiro Ueda, pair up with the Seigasha team, and with a newly promoted key animator, Kazuya Hisada, added to the staff list. With Masahiro Shimanuki's work in particular, his emphasis is clear and a radically different approach to the flow school. The artwork is heavily detailed with bold lines, hatching, and a stack of shading, with the animation, however, being quite limited, holding the key pose and bouncing the drawings up and down to give the impression of movement. Although the switches with the placement of the two characters and multiple angles the storyboard provides prevents it from being boring. Then when Piccolo and Goku do make contact, rather than complex choreography, it's quite a simple loop but with more so its quick timing driving the motion, rather than detailed movement like with Matsumoto and the other flow animators. And you can see a similar formula throughout the rest of his work and his fellow colleagues on the show. Now let's look at this scene much later in the series. Kid Buu dishes out three hits, then lands a stack of blows into him right after, rather than going through a series of different facial expressions to display the aftershock of a hit, it's more so in the very contact between the two that Shimanuki focuses in on. Instead of two frames, he holds on the key pose for upward of 20 frames and uses only two drawings, looping them on ones. Rather than animated movement, his focus is on the detail of the drawings to pull the weight, as well as timing. Shimanuki rather reserves the complexity of a scene to be in its effects, to create a flashy impact driven through the sheer amount of detail. Studio Cockpit's approach doesn't veer from this formula either. Loop flurries, speed lines, impact frames, long holds, and detailed effects animation, although their execution does slightly differ. Their timing was less modulated than Seigasha, but certainly more than a flow school animator and usually stuck to ones, twos, and threes, rather than lower frame rates again of Seigasha. Their use of spacing likewise follows the trend of being more conservative, although their core use of it to create snappy movements is no different. What's interesting is that Canada had began to shift to higher frame rates around the same time. It's difficult to tell if this was directly inspired by him or their own innovations to his style. Either way, this would give Cockpit a different sense of rhythm, a smoother type and especially through their use of slow in and slow out, rather than relying on a constant stream of more limited long holds. The other difference was their use of smears. They perhaps never took on the blobby deformation the King of Smears Matsumoto would draw, however their general frequency, but most of all intention, wasn't all too different, and that was to make the movements looser. With that extra detail to movement, it shouldn't come as a surprise that their work was more animated than your regular episode, and it's in part why their approach has seen the most praise out of any other studio. Their episodes felt lively through that extra amount of animation, but also thanks to their Canada flair and especially through their highly stylized art, breaking completely away from the model sheets. Although Cockpit's animation supervisor Keisuke Masanaga's reasons for doing it were more so for the sake of expressivity than to achieve a greater sense of motion. Generally speaking, it's still much limited compared to the flow school, but it was a powerful blend in its own right. 
In summary, the description I would give to Dragon Ball Z's action style, and especially that of, say, Garsha and Cockpit, is centered on presenting powerful impacts to the viewer. I don't just mean in regards to punches, but the overall experience from all the elements detailed thus far. While the flow animators drive a scene through its continuous motion with a focus on the smaller details, the nuance to a character's actions. Someone may be hunched over, moving his arm back and forth as he talks, or perhaps after a kick, the clothing and hair flap rapidly in the wind while the character's expression tightens. It's this level of technical detail that creates a strong impression to their work. Not through the level of details added to a drawing, but the way it physically moves. Overall, both approach action in fundamentally different ways, but the fact that both have attracted so much attention and praise for their battles speaks to the endless appeal of both schools. And that is the philosophy behind Dragon Ball Z and Naruto's action animation. Alright, so thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did putting it together and that it brought a newfound appreciation for many of the great names mentioned and yeah, generally helps spread their names out amongst both communities. Also, I would appreciate it if you could support me on Patreon as I make this content switch over, focusing on different series, much like today. But yeah, with that, thank you again and I'll see you later.